Thanks to friends of Casco Bay, and thanks to all of you for having me here tonight to talk about my favorite topic, eelgrass. I am just going to skim the surface in the time available to me on the ecology importance and threats to eelgrass in Casco Bay in hopes that this brief introduction will encourage and inspire you to dive even deeper into eelgrass, at least figuratively and maybe even literally, who knows. So eelgrass, what is it? The scientific name is Zostera marina. It's a marine angiosperm or a flowering plant. The flowers aren't very showy. It's these yellow structures here. It's one of about 50 species of seagrasses worldwide, and seagrasses are the only true flowering plants in the marine environment. These flowers, when they mature, release seeds into the marine environment, and these seeds are, are very important for maintaining eelgrass beds, but they're critical for colonizing new areas, and that's gonna be very important, as you'll see, to some of what's happened in Casco Bay. Eelgrass uh, spreads primarily, though, by vegetative propagation of new shoots along underground rhizomes, just like your lawn grasses. The habitat requirements for eelgrass in the marine environment include, first of all, light and lots of light. Eelgrass needs, on average, at least 22% of the sunlight that reaches the surface of the water to grow and thrive. So that means that the clearer the water, the deeper you're going to find eelgrass growing. It requires unconsolidated sediments, so not on hard rocks where we find our, our kelp beds and our macroalgae. It requires generally from sandy to muddy bottoms for those roots and rhizomes to penetrate. Remember, this is a rooted flowering plant. And it requires salinities greater than about 10 parts per thousand. That's a little less than one third of full sea strength. So that means that we find eelgrass growing from right along the seaboard all the way up into estuaries where the seawater salinity is diluted by freshwater from, from river and upland drainage. It must be protected from severe wave exposure, so you're not going to find it growing out on rocky headlands in Maine, but it, it can hold on really well, so it has to have a little bit of protection from, from the worst wind and wave exposure, and it also requires cool temperatures. It's a northern plant, and so it grows around the world at northern latitudes. And you know what? These habitat requirements coincide around the entire coast of Casco Bay. So why should you care about eelgrass? Well, seagrass beds are among the most productive plant communities on the planet. Seagrasses rival even agricultural crops in the amount of biomass produced per unit area. And I love this photo. I love, I love hanging out underwater in eelgrass beds, and I would really recommend it. It's peaceful, it's quiet, and you can see photosynthesis in action, which is really cool. So you can see here bubbles of oxygen produced by eelgrass photosynthesis streaming up from these leaves. This high production within eelgrass bed then translates into many benefits that are of really high value to humans. Eelgrass is the foundation of both nearshore and offshore food webs. Invertebrates like these amphipods, these are all little amphipods, all these guys. Amphipods and shrimps and copepods and snails all reach extremely high densities in eelgrass, which in turn then creates critical habitat for many of our recreationally and commercially important fish species. So small fish like these minnows and grubbies, and then juveniles and adults of larger fish like winter flounder, Atlantic cod, striped bass, all feed on the abundant invertebrates found in eelgrass beds. And eelgrass leaves are the primary settlement substrate for larval blue mussels. This is under a microscope, and this is an eelgrass leaf in the background. The eelgrass production isn't used just within the eelgrass bed, though. It certainly forms the base of many complex food webs right in that eelgrass habitat, but it's also exported to fuel offshore food webs. 
The dead plant material, the detrital particles, are carried offshore by wind and waves. And then transient consumers, all of these fish that feed in eelgrass beds, move offshore to enter offshore food webs. What people are probably most aware of are the really visible components of this ecosystem. It's critical habitat for many birds. Some waterfowl, like the Atlantic brant on the right, feed on eelgrass plant parts directly. Many more species of waterfowl, shorebirds, and wading birds, like the egret on the left, feed on the and depend on the abundant fish and invertebrate resources in these habitats. So, uh, any birders in the room know that walking along the shore of an eelgrass bed at low tide is a fabulous place for birding. This habitat performs many physical and biogeochemical functions as well. Eelgrass plants absorb nutrients. The leaves extend up into the water column and they dampen wave energy and slow currents and cause sediment to settle out. And the roots and rhizomes in the sediment bind the bottom sediments. And so all of these ecological functions together, the, the base of the food web and these biogeochemical and, and physical functions, combine to provide benefits to us, to humans, or ecosystem services. Eelgrass improves water quality, it prevents bottom scouring, it buffers shorelines from erosion, and in this era of increasing carbon dioxide emissions that's contributing to global climate change, Eelgrass is a natural and highly efficient carbon sink. It turns out that not all of that carbon that is fixed during photosynthesis is consumed or exported. In fact, a large fraction of it is buried right there. And so this sequestered carbon is no longer available to contribute to climate change. Given all of these benefits or ecosystem services, that means that loss of eelgrass beds can lead to decreased fish and wildlife populations, degraded water quality, increased shoreline erosion, and reduced capacity to remove anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. So we like eelgrass, we want to keep eelgrass. What we stand to lose when we lose eelgrass then makes the change that we've seen in recent years in Casco Bay highly disturbing. So this map shows eelgrass distribution in 2001 in the red crosshatched shade, and then that's overlaid by eelgrass distribution in, two, in August of 2013 in the solid green color. And underneath everywhere that's solid green is red crosshatches. So what we see is a tremendous loss of eelgrass that covered all of Casco Bay in the 2001 mapping interval, and then in August of 2013, it had disappeared from most of the bay's upper reaches and was found only in the lower bay. In 2001, there was about 3,300 hectares of eelgrass. In 2013, there were about uh, 13 or 1,500 hectares. It's about a 55% loss of area. We know that this dramatic decline occurred primarily in 2012 and early 2013. And the view from the head of the bay, right here, right at the top of McCoyt Bay, used to be a beautiful, continuous, gorgeous eelgrass meadow. And then in the summer of 2013, where there should have been eelgrass, there wasn't. So in identifying what the possible causes for this really dramatic and rapid loss of eelgrass could be, we look at what the major threats to eelgrass are worldwide, which include reduced water quality, direct physical human disturbances, sediment organic enrichment, natural physical disturbances, climate change induced increases in summertime temperature, disease, toxic pollutants, and animal disturbance. That's the laundry list of the major threats to eelgrass worldwide. Well, as we've heard, we know that this loss of eelgrass in 2012 and 2013 coincided with a population explosion of green crabs in Casco Bay. 
and both last summer and this summer, I gathered crab-damaged shoots from the Casco Bay shoreline. The, these eelgrass shoots that washed up show the characteristic shredding of the leaf bases and clipping of the shoots that signifies green crab damage. Green crabs aren't uh, preferentially, typically feeding on eelgrass, it just gets in the way as their foraging uh, activity is excavating in the bottom sediments to get to their preferred prey items. And so they're very good at mowing down eelgrass. I then performed a short exclosure experiment last summer up here in a formerly vegetated flat in which I planted eelgrass inside and outside of protective crab exclosures to test whether the environmental conditions in Casco Bay could, could support eelgrass growth in the absence of green crabs. And lo and behold, as long as the eelgrass was protected from crab damage, it could grow uh, and survive just fine. And so this combined evidence points to green crabs as one, certainly one of the primary causes of this dramatic, almost overnight loss of over half of the eelgrass in Casco Bay, and it elevates animal disturbance, specifically bioturbation by green crabs, to become one of the major threats to eelgrass in Casco Bay today. And as, as dramatic, drastic, and important as this acute loss of eelgrass due to green crab activity is, we can't forget about these other threats to eelgrass that are, are going to be critical to address if we're going to restore and uh, restore eelgrass and protect the, the remaining habitat that we have. The primary threat to eelgrass and the primary cause of loss worldwide. Remember, this species grows around the world. And the primary threat is reduced water quality through nitrogen and sediment inputs to the coastal zone. The contributions of, of nitrogen and sediment come from different sources, from point source discharges directly from pipes, and then from non-point sources from diffuse locations in the watershed. Passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 cleaned up a lot of our point source discharges of pollutants into the coastal zone. And so the primary cause of our impaired coastal waters today is from non-point source inputs from the watershed. And these come from residential and urban development, agricultural and forestry practices, industrial airborne pollutants, those are all sources in the watershed of these uh, nitrogen and, and sediment pollutants. Groundwater and surface water then carries these substances into coastal creeks, rivers, and estuaries, and they enter the coastal zone. What that means is a reduction in light available for eelgrass photosynthesis. So how does that work? The increases in sediment cause more sediment to be suspended in the water column, which uh, absorbs light and reflects light. It attenuates light as it's passing through the water column, so it reduces the amount that's reaching the bottom for eelgrass. The nitrogen stimulates blooms of phytoplankton and stimulates growth of epiphytic algae on leaf surfaces. And so these algal communities further reduce the amount of light that's getting to the leaf surface for photosynthesis. Remember, eelgrass needs a lot of light. And so the way this light reduction is manifested in an eelgrass bed is loss of eelgrass at the deep edge and persistence only where it's shallower, where there's less distance for the light to travel. So reductions in water quality means reduction in the amount of light that's reaching the bottom, and typically means that you're only going to find, you're going to lose eelgrass in deep areas, you're going to find it persisting up in the shallow areas. Ultimately, with continued degradation in water quality, you will not have enough light even in the shallows for eelgrass to persist. Now, interestingly, there are some areas in Casco Bay where we're seeing migration of the deep edge of the eelgrass bed up slope. So right here off Mackworth Island, which is between Portland's Bat Cove and Great Diamond Island, we see that 
the outer edge of the bed that was mapped in 2001 disappeared by the remapping in 2013. It would take a lot more analysis to look at the bathymetry here in a, in a, at a, a fine level of resolution. I've looked at it at a coarse level of resolution. So it, it would take more analysis, but one could look at that and it, it suggests that there may have been a decrease in water clarity over these mapping intervals over this decade or so, 12, 12 years. The other very important threat to eelgrass worldwide is from direct human disturbance. Many human activities have small local impacts, but the cumulative impact of all of these in, of these uh, sources of disturbance together can be very far-reaching. For example, uh, in, in our waters, dredge and fill activities in the coastal zone, pier construction, other coastal construction can affect eelgrass. Anchors and moorings in eelgrass beds can leave donut-shaped scars where the anchor chain is dragging around the mooring. Propellers of recreational boats can cut right through the eelgrass bed, and then mechanized dragging for shellfish of different types can cause impacts. These bottom pictures are from a dragging event in the upper bay, in, in McCoyt Bay, in 1999 that left really big scars in the eelgrass bed. Well, over 30 hectares in one area had disappeared. What does the future hold? The, the coast of Maine, historically, has been defined by eelgrass. So this is the eelgrass map in yellow from the 1992 to 1998 mapping interval done by Seth Barker at the Department of Marine Resources. And you see that the eelgrass pretty much outlines the coast of Maine. Here we are in Casco Bay. As we've seen, the, the tremendous impact that our new or, or new this era anyway, invader green crabs have had on eelgrass, we know that the future of eelgrass in Casco Bay is inextricably linked to the future of the green crab population. Now, that's a very complex issue, and it's going to be addressed both by more scientific information and by collaborations among the interests represented on this panel and among all of you in this room. It's going to take a collaborative effort to address this type of loss. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing that all of us can do to protect eelgrass. There are things that we all can do to protect this habitat. So we can personally be responsible for the potential threats from water quality degradation and, and from direct human physical impacts. We can reduce nutrient runoff by minimizing our use of lawn fertilizers, maintaining septic systems in efficient and working order. We can reduce sediment runoff by avoiding clearing our coastal property, planting native vegetation to stabilize shorelines. Uh, it is legally mandated to avoid impacts from marine and coastal construction on eelgrass beds. And we should avoid anchoring an eelgrass when we're out boating in Casco Bay. Pick a sand patch to throw down your anchor rather than eelgrass patch, because when you pull up that anchor in an eelgrass bed, you're going to leave behind a, a hole like that in the eelgrass. We should lift our motor when we're passing over eelgrass so we're not cutting those deep scars in the bed that are going to take several years to recover in one scar alone. And there are eelgrass-friendly moorings, and so we don't need to be using the traditional block and chain moorings that are leaving those donut-shaped scars in eelgrass beds. There's new, newer uh, helical anchors that screw down in the substrate with an elastic attachment for mooring so that there's nothing scraping the eelgrass bed. So there are things that every one of us in this room can do to protect eelgrass. I hope that you're inspired to take some of these actions, to learn more about this habitat, and to join the rest of your friends and neighbors in protecting it. Thank you very much for your company.